All right, guys. Um, we'll go ahead and get started briefly. Um, I'm not usually a moderator of panels as such, so I will not do the stereotypical moderation of panels. Um, I also find these things extremely boring if it's not engaging, so let's make it more Can fun. Can we have a, like, like impromptu debates about something? No, yes, we, we, we totally will, so, so <laughs> just trust me on this, it's gonna be good. I'll anything, any I'll side. take either side, I don't I care. I will debate anything, I don't that's care. What, okay, that's, great, that's amazing, what I said. amazing, okay. Um, I'm gonna ha ask my panelists to please shut up now and let, <laughs> let the star of the show go. <laughs> um, okay, sweet. Thank you guys for coming. Um, I know it is very difficult to publicly speak and you know, get all of the charisma out there, but you know, I'm you guys are brave right now. I know, you guys are the bravest soldiers that God has Wait, fighting I, I want a beer. I told you you're here to get a beer. <laughs> Vivian, could you get? <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, Mine everyone. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna start moderating. Gotta take now. control of the room, dude. Yes. Okay, Brent Banksy, please shut up. Um, okay, we'll start off with uh, Jelena. So if you can go ahead and give your. Actually, I'm gonna start off with my own intro, <laughs> just to make this actually work out. Um, so my name is Zahir Eptikar. I run a liquid hedge fund in the space. We do zero venture because every time I, you know, kind of have a panel, people ask me like afterwards to invest in their protocol. I we do not. Um, unfortunately, I, I personally angel, but I don't uh, venture invest broadly th uh, with, with the firm. Um, it's something I'm very passionate about, and I've been in the space now for about seven years across the board. Um, and so, you know, hopefully we get a really good, you know, panel. Like, thankfully we have amazing panelists, so we'll have a great kind of session. Um, and I'll pass it on over. Awesome. I'm Yelena. Good to uh, see some familiar faces. I'm the co-founder CEO of Noble. So Noble is a uh, layer one blockchain. Uh, we specialize in native asset issuance. And that might sound contradictory because isn't every blockchain an asset issuance chain? Um, and uh, not so fast. Uh, so what we uh, are really betting on is that uh, as um, you know, developers and, and, and companies decide to uh, launch uh, their own chain, uh, their own application-specific blockchain, you know, otherwise referred to as an L2 or an L3 or maybe a roll-up, um, they will need uh, a stable, uh, reliable sources of uh, stable coin liquidity specifically. So we started off in the Cosmos space. We brought native USDC to 30 plus Cosmos blockchains, including Injective. We were partnered with Ondo as well. They were on the panel before us to bring native USDY to Cosmos. And ultimately we see ourselves as this very neutral um, uh, layer between the uh, asset issuer, so a circle, an Ondo, a hash note, et cetera, and the end destination chain uh, or roll up. So ultimately, blockchains will continue to be fragmented. We will see a proliferation of many app chains, many L2s, many roll up execution environments, and they will all need um, reliable sources of stable coin liquidity. So that's me and Noble. By the way, you know, cheers. Cheers to everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, all right. Absolutely. Cheers. Cheers. Yes. It's been great to work with you so far. Okay. Hey, hey, everyone. I'm actually not Juan. That picture is not Juan, <laughs> and um, and that picture is not me. So I'm <laughs> Sina, and I am the strategy lead at Babylon. So at least one of the aspects of that three-part uh, picture is correct. So I, my name is Sina. I'm the strategy lead at Babylon, and. Babylon is the first uh, protocol to bring native uh, non-custodial staking for Bitcoin and in order to uh, validate and uh, secure other POS systems. So for the very first time, you can have your Bitcoin, stake it in your own wallet and earn yield in a non-custodial trustless way. So this brings the Bitcoin and connects it for the first time to the, to the world of, uh, to the rest of the crypto ecosystem which was previously an island uh, separated from Bitcoin. Uh, I'm excited to get into this with the, pa with the panelists. Sweet. And Babylon is an incredible Cosmos project as well. Yes. <laughs> I think we've all three worked together, and I've never met either of you guys before. Correct. In person. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Bernd Banksy. Uh, I run Zion, which is a protocol that's most frequently described as the most exciting project of 2024. Um, <laughs> but we are a pioneer. It's not my words. someone else's. Um, 
<laughs> working on a chain abstraction for the idea of making crypto disappear. Sweet. Thank you, guys. Um, and we'll just jump right into questions here that I'm dying to know. Um, why, are you guys, why are you guys laughing? Um, so the topic of the panel is, you know, uh, I didn't even know. No novel primitives, you know, broadly. And um, I think a lot of conversation as of late has been, you know, for new projects, for new protocols that are kind of coming out, um, what are we actually building in this space and how relevant is it to the average person? Um, and I want to ask each and every one of you here, um, you know, what do you think it is that you're really trying to solve for? Um, and how do you think that actually makes a material difference in, you know, crypto tomorrow? Okay, I'll begin. So uh, as you can tell by my hat, uh, you know, uh, we're just modular people living in a modular world. And what that means is whether you're building your own, you know, highly performant, scalable layer one, EVM, et cetera, you know, layer two, whatever it might be, you will necessarily need to create uh, workflows and UX systems that make it easy for your target, um, you know, end user to find your kind of suite of products and services wherever they may uh, run. And so, as chains obviously continue to uh, you know, proliferate across many different environments, whether that's L2s on Ethereum or even L3s on top of Arbitrum or, of course, uh, you know, Cosmos chains, you're going to continue to have this uh, you know, very complicated um, kind of uh, uh, environment where inevitably you'll need uh, kind of uh, tools within the chain abstraction world to one, like make it really easy for obviously end users to interact with your suite of applications, but two, also uh, retain some sense of security and some sense of um, reliability. Um, you know, not just things like chain uptime, but even things like managing bridging, you know, environments and things like this. And so, for end developers, I, this is like a necessary, I think, um, kind of conundrum you have to, you have to grapple with. And there are many many tools and kind of execution environments and you know services that you can kind of leverage to again make it really easy for your end user to sort of um, get to the destination. You know whether you know that's you know um, you know an order book built on top of the injective chain or you know a dex you know some sort of lending protocol on. Uh, you know, on uh, on Cosmos or whatever it might be, you have to find. You know, you have to create those systems to, to make it really easy to, for those end users to kind of get to, to get to that destination. And so, um, you know, modularity and kind of this fragmentation of of many systems will continue. So, you know, building these workflows will be you know more and more important. And Noble fits into that from a stablecoin perspective, but there's obviously many service providers that uh, are focused on these problems. Awesome. And Sino, for, for you? Um, for Babylon, I think it's like our value proposition is very simple. So you have Bitcoin. It's the most, it's the oldest, most decentralized, most secure asset that we have, yet it's completely segregated from the rest of the POS system. And we also have this surge in uh, restaking and what you want restaking is putting up a collateral to secure, secure crypto economic things. And yet this asset that is the most pristine asset, the most collateral worthy asset is not able to participate in this, participate in this ecosystem of crypto, uh, crypto economic shared security. So uh, our founder, the person is on, on that picture, is, uh, <laughs> was, uh, was actually helping with the, with the Ethereum POS transition uh, while it was happening for Merge 2. And out of that, we've got a lot of uh, um, inspiration for how do we make this possible for Bitcoin? So through some uh, uh, cryptography magic and just a, a clever design, even though Bitcoin doesn't have the expressiveness of uh, the Ethereum, we were, uh, David and his team were able to create a way for Bitcoin to be not, uh, like natively staked to secure other POS systems. So this, what this does is it enables, this is the core primitive. Obviously, staking is one of the most core primitives in all of DeFi. And bringing it to the largest asset, most decentralized asset, is like a very big unlock. Because then on top of that can be built other things like 
when when Ethereum went through this, the the the, the set of innovations that happened that followed it were like enormous. First, it was Lido, then it was restaking, then it was self-repaying loans and lending against wheel-bearing assets, and all sorts of things came after. And we're excited to build this core primitive to hopefully unlock others to build all sorts of things that we can't even imagine on top of the, this uh, Bitcoin being at, being connected to the world of uh, the rest of the POS systems. And Brent Banksy? Uh, yeah, the, the question is, what are we building for? Yeah, like, you know, we, we spend a lot of time in this space and funding a lot of, you know, what everyone else considers vaporware. Um, you know, how, right, how they're you, mostly correct. Um, sure, but, but and then how do you think about yourself, right? Because vaporware. Every, well, but everyone thinks that they're right, you know, and I know you're, 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 you're generally kidding, but everyone thinks that their project is, like, materially better, and, you know, this is a panel where we really are at the forefront of building new tech, right? So... Um, yeah. How does that materialize? I mean, it, I think it's interesting because uh, both Noble and Babylon we work with to kind of achieve our mission. And I think there wouldn't be the future of crypto without the kind of collaboration that we have. So, for example, everything that we kind of build with the idea of saying crypto in its current form sucks. Um, and we think that we need to reach the user. And the way that uh, we at Zion approach that is by saying we're going to come to them email login, credit card, everything's denominated in dollars, which is where Noble comes into the picture, and then having incredible crypto economic security, which is where Babylon comes into the picture, right? And so I would say that there is never going to be one crypto project that kind of wins everything without the support of everyone else. I think we often forget the importance of like coordination and you know coordination mechanisms used to be like a hot topic in Ethereum land a few years ago and if you control F you know coordination mechanisms like on Vitalik's blog post I'm sure it comes up more than once um, but we kind of forgot uh, as like uh, you know we in the last few years really kind of pre modular season, if that's a thing. Um, we kind of forgot, right, about, about coordination mechanisms and how important it is to think about, like, st standardization. And, you know, I think only really recently with, like, you know, the the many bridge hacks and, like, the many ex ex exploits are we now realizing, oh, no, you know, we can't just rely on, you know, um, one, you know, s shared security model, right? Like, we're innovating now, like, with Bitcoin shared security and obviously with different interoperability standards and... Yeah, I mean, there's no one app. There's also no one infra, per, you know, solution. There's also no one, um, you know, ecosystem. And yeah, having to standardize across many ecosystems will continue to be super important. And you know, it's uh, it's good to see us doing that. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I guess, you know, uh, oftentimes when we do panels and t conferences and talks and things like this. Um, it seems like a kumbaya moment where everyone is getting along and whatnot. But how do you guys, you I know? I sense a spicy question coming. Yeah, well, <laughs> good. I, I'll, do, I'll go in reverse order here. Um, how do you guys think about your competition? How do you guys think about, you know, I, I, the, the usual response I get is that the pie is big enough and everyone can win and all these things. But realistically, it's not. Um, but we're going in reverse okay. order here. So we'll no, you, you could take okay. it. Okay. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Well, sorry, okay. Um, how, do we, how do we think about competition? Uh, incentives. Who is the best position to achieve a certain outcome? And who are the stakeholders that have a vested interest in that, in that outcome? So again, like, I think it's really important to consider like, yeah, there's a pie, the pie gets bigger, the pie sometimes gets smaller, maybe there's like many pies, <laughs> but at the end of the day, there are certain incentives that certain um, protocols have, and other, like for example, Babylon, right? Like their um, kind of pie is like Bitcoin, and like that's probably one of, you know, probably the biggest pie that exists per protocol. And so their pie is also to uh, grow the, you know, proof of stake shared security pie, which is a massive pie. And so their incentives are, you know, very specific to that. Noble, obviously, we see ourselves as this, like, a very neutral kind of issuance layer where we're not looking to compete with the next perp stacks. We're not looking to compete with the next, you know, a AMM or, or things like this. We're simply focused on growing um, stablecoin TVL for many issuers across many protocols, across many chains, across many interop standards. So I think when you talk about competition, it really ta you, you have to think about incentives. I think we often think about like the end product, like oh, you know, I'm building like you know a an AMM, but like is my incentive therefore to compete with Uniswap? Maybe that's like not the best thing to be doing, um, or or maybe it is because you have a very 
different type of AMM. I'm not sure if, you know, what, what that could, might be specifically, but ultimately I think it's about like the incentives, like what are you building, who are you building it for, and what are the stakeholders that have a vested interest to see that project succeed or, or, or not succeed? Yeah, I mean, for us, we are basically, there's two ways to think about competition. One is that obviously you can think about your own category, like, okay, we have like a competition in this shared security marketplace, like you can either use Ethereum for shared security or Bitcoin, but also we're all competing against like other people uh, for, for limited times and resources of other projects who want to integrate with, the, with you. Everyone has a limited amount of time and resources to dedicate to different integrations in crypto, right? So you want to be very focused on what value proposition you bring and you want to be a best partner for each of the, your, each of your uh, stakeholders in order to provide some real value. So for us, we, very, we want to keep things very simple. We bring this very like a native primitive to Bitcoin and will help the POS systems reduce their inflation and we just want to be the best partner in those two areas and create a vibrant marketplace. Everything else that's distracting and trying to like uh, compete against other players is going to ultimately be a detriment to our, our goal. So um, I, want, I think I would, I would just say uh, the way we kind of focus on competition is to focus on what is our unique value proposition and then be the best partner for that and let others take uh, uh, other seemingly shiny objects and run with those. Yeah, I mean, and to your point earlier, most of this industry is vaporware. Uh, and so there are times where it is pretty hard to discern where someone could be saying the exact same thing as you, and they're probably just going to keep talking and keep talking until nothing really happens. And that's just this industry. Like, either you're going to pivot, someone's going to pivot, you're going to have money in tower, and then lose it all. So it's like, it's a crapshoot at the end of the day. Um, competition is fine for if you want to increase a narrative's market share, but I think other than that, anything deemed as a real threat is pretty much foolish. Do you guys remember when um, SBF was pitching to Sequoia and he said, my TAM is like every single person on earth? I think like that's another red flag. If like your like TAM is like trillions of dollars, I don't know, maybe it's time to like narrow down and focus a little bit. And I maybe, maybe dream bigger, Yelena. <laughs> Dream bigger than every single person on earth. No, I think why we not need the to, universe? We, yeah, we need to be building for like real outcomes and like real people and real uh, like incentives. And I think like when we have these like fugazi like you know every person on earth like statements, I think it actually does a disservice. And I'm not saying that every person on earth will not eventually be interacting with like crypto economic systems in one way or another, as everyone you know mostly on earth now interacts with the internet, but. It takes time, and I think to get there, we need to be, um, you know, a little bit more outcomes focused. Like PayPal did not become PayPal by just saying every single person will one day, you know, wanna, you know, send money on the internet. They started off with industries. It was actually like the uh, tra travel industry that really needed, you know, um, internet payments. So I think it's important to really, you know, be outcomes focused. And see, you know, you have the last comment. If you look like you have sure. something to say, no doubt. Nothing to add to that. That was already very good. Awesome. Okay. Um, and I'll try to get one last question in here as well. Um, I think there is a fundamental problem that I view with crypto today, and even with this panel or like a, like ECC broadly, uh, which is that we like to index on the 100,000 power users that exist that understand any of the conversation that we're willing to have, right? Um, and, you know, people commit their lives to building something, right? Or, like, I see, um, look, I, I'm, a, I'm a liquid markets person, right? I have to price the space every single day, every single second, um, and that changes all the time. So my view of, my, you know, optimistically what crypto can look like versus what it looks like today or, you know, uh, how I have to price it today is very different. Um, but I guess my, my point in mentioning this is that we're, you know, everyone likes to say that we're building for this future and like all these users and all this stuff, but it seems like we still can't break away from this problem of having 100,000 people globally, and even that might be a stretch, I don't know, uh, that really understands the space. And we like to make fun of Luna, when in reality, Luna is probably the best app this space has ever made, right? With the largest, broadest based user base, right? Um, same thing with FTX, right? Like it worked substantially well. Um, and, you know, there's millions, uh, hundreds of thousands of claim holders, right, that 
prove this every single day. Yeah. And like, you know, the, the, the largest single use case in crypto still by a long shot is payment remittance yeah. through Tether on Tron, right? Which is an extreme, you know, and like we like to build all this fancy tech, but like why, why is it that all of the most fraudulent tech, quote unquote, ends up winning, right? Um, so I have a, uh, so my, my point is like, how do we get from this question here of building stuff that's like really niche um, or really specific into being able to convey this to someone in the long run? So I think it's really interesting because we talk a lot about, you know, FTX and Terra. I, I would agree with you, right? Like I would agree that at a certain point, these were like the killer apps that brought in, you know, millions of people into the space. Well, yeah, probably millions of people, yeah. Many millions. Many millions, um, you know, of mindshare, which is just obviously a huge success. I think at the end of the day is what is what's ha what has sticking power and what paves the way for something, uh, you know, bigger than itself to actually take hold. I think stable coins are obviously probably one of the best examples of this. If you look at like the total stable coin market, like it's exponentially increased from the early, you know, conceptions of Tether and, and USDC. I think for Terra, you know, Terra, you know, in some sense, like walked. So, you know, stable coins like USDC could run, right? And same with FTX, like FTX, you know, failed, but that actually gave more legitimacy to Coinbase and more legitimacy even to Binance after they settled. And so I think it's not necessarily about what single project brings in the most users. It's what are the services that people clearly want? They want centralized exchanges. They need these on ramps. They want stable coins. You know, they do want DeFi. And so how do you kind of like, contain that stickiness and, and continue onboarding those like next generations of, of users. And so, sure, Terra at the, at the time was, you know, the best app, but Terra's legacy is more than just Terra. It's actually the entire stablecoin market. And, you know, I would actually argue like app chains as well. They, they, they kind of put app chains on the map in some sense. So that would be my perspective. I think what like sets those examples apart is that they were extremely focused things, right? Like, so Terra was you could get a stable coin and you can get, get like some like 20% yield on it or maybe like 20% was too high and unsustainable but it was very easy to understand for people what the point of it was same thing with FTX was like maybe the best the best exchange and the fastest exchange you could work with and it had a lot of assets that other maybe things the other uh, exchanges were too slow to in incorporate it was like the best experience for trading now in the background it was a big, but there was a reason why it was the best experience of trading because it was not all you know, all, all real but it, but from the user's perspective, it was it was a very clear thing what it, what what it was. A lot of projects are right now trying to be almost a lot of different things, and they kind of like uh, pride themselves on complex language and all sorts of uh, big brain like a um, moon math kind of things. And that's not the type of thing that will attract millions of people. So I think um, that's another one of the reasons why at Babylon we just want to say non-custodial yield for your Bitcoin uh, in a way that you don't have to give your Bitcoin away or give it, give it, give it to someone else or bridge, bridge it or any sort of other trust assumptions. So this is very simple and we're foregoing a lot of more and more uh, fancy things that you get that, that, that there's a discourse about with regards to Bitcoin, but that's, that would come at, a, at the cost of like losing focus. So we want to just stay, stick to our lane for that. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, at the time, I think FTX was not, I mean, I, I, aside from like Binance, OKX, and a bunch of other exchanges, they were probably towards like the middle of the pack when it came to exchanges, and they were just another exchange. So I don't really think they were doing anything fundamentally different, um, except for like good marketing and fraud, um, which like others do as well. So it's not, they just got kind of caught. Um, you know, and, and I think with Terra, they were, or Luna, how, it's not an app, right? Like they had Chai, they had, Anchor, they had, and none of these were inherently innovative. You just got yield somewhere, or you got like synthetic somewhere, which, you know, if you want to take that comp and say, okay, well, let's compare actually that to Ethereum or Solana, Ethereum probably having like a $200 billion market cap at the time. Like, I don't think there was inherently anything like really, really ex that exciting about Terra. Of course, you had like, Circle, and you also had Dai, and you had a bunch of other stable coins as well. I think they're known, especially now, because of the uh, kind of situation that they were brought into. Um, but I think, to the point, nothing really innovative has kind of happened since then. I think you only really see 
NFT marketplaces, swaps, AMMs, um, and yield bearing protocols, and that's the only products you've ever seen in this industry for the past five years. Um, so you're asking the question of, well, how do we actually get users? It's build fucking products um, and make something exciting. Fair enough. Thank you guys all for joining us today on the panel. Um, please, a round of applause for our lovely thank panelists. You. Standing, yeah, standing ovation. Yeah, thank you.